Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have returning guest, Bill Franks. Bill, welcome to the show. Hi, glad to be here. Now, Bill, for people who don't know or may have missed our last interview, you worked very closely for many years with uh, Mr. Hubbard, the founder of the Church of Scientology. And in fact, in your 14 years in the Sea Org, you became a lieutenant commander to a very high rank, and eventually you became the Executive Director International of the Church of Scientology. Having said that, and, and you having worked with L. Ron Hubbard, I wanted to get in an incident that you posted on uh, ESMB, a message board, which became pretty famous when you posted it some years ago. And this goes to an incident that happened in 1974 on the flagship Apollo, and you're with David Mayo. That sets the stage. Could, could you tell us what happened? Sure. And one, we had a fellow who uh, wanted to leave. Per the uh, church's doctrine, anybody who wants to leave has got overts and withholds. And so what you do is you sec check him, which basically it just sort of beats them into submission. Though that's not the stated... Uh, end result, but that is what happens. So we sec checked the hell out of this guy and he still wanted to leave. And then he finally left. And it was a hard thing to do to leave the ship because uh, all passports were confiscated once you came on board. But this fellow left, just went to the embassy. We were in Morocco. I think we were in Safi at the time. We had to uh, report this up to Hubbard. Oh, man, that's not going to make him happy. No, he's uh, was he's very unhappy. He was very aware of what we were doing with this guy. So we gathered up all the, the sex checking he had just to show that we had followed procedure and uh, we did everything that we could do to keep this guy uh, on course and sent it up to him with saying, look, you know, we did everything we could and the guy still left. Now, this is you and David Mayo and uh, David Mayo at the time, he is... Uh, He's a senior CS international. Okay, so the... And he was a senior CS flag as well. So the top tech terminal of the church, and you send that to L. Ron Hubbard. How does L. How, how does L. Ron Hubbard react? Well, we waited, and we waited, and we waited. I think we sent this up, I'm guessing, around 10 o'clock in the evening. Finally, about 3 o'clock in the morning... Uh, we were sort of stewing in uh, David's office in the tween decks area. And uh, <clears throat> Claire, uh, it was Claire Popham now, that's not her name, but uh, that's her, not, she's married now, but still in the church, I understand. Came down with a dispatch from Hubbard in writing, uh, his handwriting, and said, extremely confidential. Dear Dave and Bill, uh, I see what you guys have done. Uh, I'm about to tell you something that no one should ever hear again. And if they do, you'll basically have uh, ruined my chance of controlling people and controlling the church. Now, mind you, this is what this was a while ago. So this would be what 40 years ago. Was that long ago? Yeah. 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 So it went on to say people, he says this, and he said it's not, people don't leave because of overts. They leave because their air is sea broken. They're upset. David and I looked at one another because this, in one sentence, he basically had all of the Scientology technology is based on overts and withholds. And we were in the middle of uh, this OEC FEBC program that was based on delivering the L10, 11, and 12, which are all about overts and withholds. In fact, in one way or the other, 80, I'd say my guess was around 80% of the Scientology technology is based on overts and withholds. And that's what sticks people to things and makes them unable and makes them uh, hate themselves and has other people hating them and why they leave it's because or or 
they start one thing and leave it to go on to something else, it's because of overts and withholds. And that's what's drummed in from almost day one. And so Hubbard has just told you and David Mayo that people actually leave because of ARC breaks. Yes. And that devastates you and David Mayo. Well, yeah, it, it devastated us, but it also, not for the reason that you might think, it was like, holy shit, what are we doing here? <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? So, um, well, on a, pr a practical matter, you, do you have to give the piece of paper with the message on it back to Hubbard's messenger? Yes. I mean, this has to be. It, it was it was written down for the purpose of we had to take it back, and we were never to say anything to anybody. We weren't even, you know, in those kind of incidents, you get the idea that you're not even supposed to be thinking about this beyond uh, in in the future. Just blot it out. Well, what does this do to your uh, image of L. Ron Hubbard? I mean, he uncharacter uncharacteristically blurts something out like this. What it did was uh, the magnitude of it was that, you know, if you really thought this through, it immediately told you the entire entirety of Scientology was a fraud. Now, here is David, who's the senior CS, and here's Bill uh, trying to deal with this. And I just didn't want to think about it too much. I remember I didn't even I didn't even talk about it with my wife at the time. Well, no, how could you? Yeah. It was just, it was considered, I didn't quite know what to make of it. And to be real honest with you, it wasn't until David and I uh, met one another in 1983 in, in Montecito. He had a house up there, or 84, I guess it would have been. And, uh, you know, we went out to dinner, our, we were with our wives, and uh, we started talking about this. And, and I think this is probably the first time that he was ta had talked about this in the open as well as myself. And that's interesting. It shows the level uh, or the extent of, of repression that something that, that significant you really can't talk about until decades later. Exacto mundo. It was, it, it was, it basically said everything is a lie. Hard to talk for Mayo, but I, I think David Mayo thought the same. He thought the same thing, and uh, it probably had more effect on him. Being here, he was the uh, uh, head of all auditing in application of the technology, quote unquote, for Scientology. It, it just it was unbelievable. You know, it's interesting, and it it would be perhaps akin to uh, a, a Christian being told that. Jesus really isn't the Son of God. Mm -hmm. That we that we just say that, and that's not too much of a stretch. Uh, and and I realize that Christianity and Scientology are two different things. I'm just trying to give our listeners a sense of how big of a deal this is. The, the basis of your religion has been undermined by the founder, Bill. In our earlier interview, you said that L. Ron Hubbard could be sloppy in his behavior. Was this note to you and David Mayo an example of being sloppy in his behavior? Or why do you think what motivated him to give you this note and this remarkable admission? I don't I don't really know, except that uh, just in thinking about it now, in an in intimate setting, you know, where it was just him and us, he, he totally would lose the whole persona of the founder. And he would talk as if he were working in the engine room. So every once in a while, you know, life is lonely at the top, but every once in a while, he doesn't want to be L. Ron Hubbard founder. He just has to be Ron, and he has to talk about what's really going on in his head. Mm -hmm. Because you did mention in our last interview, he would, he would tell you in those late night talks in his quarters, Bill, I just need more money and more power. I crave it. And now he's, he's treating you as a confidant once again, you and David Mayo. It was that, but it was also making us sort of partners in the crime. Oh, I see. That's intriguing. He, this is, I think, what hit me, and I think it must have hit David equally, or maybe twice as hard, is uh, we're now complicit 
and this subterfuge. That's very insightful on your part and unexpected. That's the, the, you know, the last thing I would have guessed. But yeah, that does make you complicit in this uh, in the technology of Scientology. It has some hidden parts to it. And what I'll say, Bill, in the history of uh, esoteric or occult spirituality, there's a part you don't, a part you see, and a part you don't see. So there's a part that the high priests or priestesses get to see and a part that the rank and file don't get to see. So in one sense, Hubbard is opening his kimono to you. He's showing you one of the secrets. So he is making you complicit. It was a pretty uncomfortable feeling. And that's why you really couldn't think about it. Well, yeah, not objectively. Uh, however, shortly thereafter, um, I got off the ship. Well, I got off and it was probably another, about a year. But I left in uh, 75 to work in DC. And I just said at that point, number one, I wasn't going back to flag. And two, uh, I was going to stay uh, and either try to reform everything or, or I was just going to leave, which is what ended up happening. Bill, before we go on to your efforts to reform the church, which is a certainly noteworthy uh, chapter in Church of Scientology history, part of L. Ron Hubbard's thinking goes to being PTS, a potential trouble source. And I want to go back to 1973 on the ship in the Apollo to ask you a question. In 1973, L. Ron Hubbard had a very serious motorcycle accident. Mm -hmm. Now, he basically has a Harley Davidson he keeps on the ship. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the ship was in Tenerife. Okay. And Hubbard wants to put his Harley Davidson and he goes for a ride up on the hills, uh, takes his big Harley around a corner, skids and breaks some ribs. Were you, were you on the ship when this happened? I was. I don't I don't know if, if, the, if that's the exact time, but I was on the ship when he broke his ribs. The internet gives it a 73, so let's, you know, that reading the wiki page on it here. But regardless of the date, Hubbard is brought onto the ship and he's been injured. Do you think he had an accident because he was PTS or was that not? Because he's Hubbard, is he exempt from being PTS? And the reason I ask is Hubbard said the only cause of accidents is if you're PTS. And then he has an accident on his motorcycle. How was that treated on the ship? Well, I, nobody talked about it. I mean, you thought about it. I, and I can't be the only one who thought. You start making excuses for him. Well, it must be he's PTS to something that, you know, Zeno or all these Galactic Confederation personalities, you know. Uh, something big something much bigger than than anybody could uh, deal with well I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that because Hubbard views himself as a uh, cosmic personality who is very informed on local uh, galactic politics <laughs> <You know? laughs> well I mean, he, yeah he would, I mean he would give these lectures in the 50s about the political scene in this sector of the galaxy you know, and they're quite something to, to listen to, and you can find them on the internet. But so he, he's viewed as a cosmic personality. Now, at one point, Hubbard made a claim that uh, going doing the OT materials in 68, he broke his back. Right. That the spiritual force of the realization he had was so big, it broke his back. It was more than the human form could bear. Do you remember this? him describing it this way? Well, I, yeah, I read it. I mean, I, in fact, actually, Yvonne Gillum told me some of that story. I think she was there, but that was before I got into Scientology. Bill, one thing that so fascinates people, when you have a, a larger-than-life character like L. Ron Hubbard, and you consider him to be a cosmic personality, there's always the disjunct of dealing with the day-to-day -day human L. Ron Hubbard. And when he tells you that uh, people don't leave because of overts and withholds, but because of ARC breaks, it's almost like you're getting to peer behind the curtain on the Wizard of Oz and see the real guy. Exactly, yes. 
having seen that, having sort of lost your, your innocence or your belief, you leave the ship in 75 and make a vow to never go back to flag. And yet you also want to reform the church. Can you tell us about your thinking on how to reform the Church of Scientology in 1975? Uh, I hadn't really thought it through. I just said either I'm going to fix it or I'm leaving. Well, that's quite a bold statement coming from you, but you had confidence in your own abilities, confidence in your own mind, and you had a good communications line with L. Ron Hubbard. Yes. So what developed between, you know, 1975 and when you finally left in 81? What's the general trend? What things do you do? Well, let me see. I did another tour on the RPF when uh, at Flag. Uh, ironically, David Mayo uh, called a rock slam on me. I had been recalled to Flag from Washington. I think that was in February of '78. And so this would have been your third trip into the RPF. Yes. No. Can you tell our uh, listeners what a rock slam is and what the significance of it, it is as a meter phenomenon? Well, as a meter phenomenon, it, it's the needle starts shaking back and forth very violently. And uh, it's supposed to be reflecting crimes. There are hidden crimes here. And uh, if you, you get a rock slam, it means you're, it basically was interpreted as you're a suppressive person. So David Mayo uh, calls a rock slam. Are you immediately put into the RPF or, or are you sec check further? What happens when you get no, a rock he, slam? He had been sec checking me for, uh, I was called to flag in February of 78. And uh, I think he, he sec checked me for like six weeks on a daily basis except for Saturdays and Sundays. He finally called us rock slam on me. Two days later, I was in the RPF. You're suddenly your third time in the RPF. It, 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 mind you, it made it, I was just thinking now, it was even weirder because David and I had this bond from that night back in 74. So, and we're sitting there talking about overts and withholds. That's what the whole purpose was to find out what I was doing to undermine, God knows what, the church. But we, we had this understanding that, that Hubbard had told us this is all bullshit. And yet uh, David Mayo circles back around to say that you're a rock slammer. Yeah. Do you feel like he put a knife in your back or did you understand that's just the way of the church? No, I it's just sort of like, uh, you know, the Godfather. It's just business, nothing personal. <laughs> 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 nothing personal, <laughs> no, nothing personal, Bill, but you're a rock slammer. <laughs> right. My God, that is pretty brutal because you've related to me in our, in our conversations off air, how, just how torturous, uh, how tortured the RPF is. Uh, it was terrible. That, that third time, it wasn't so bad on the ship the two times before, but this time it was really brutal down in, uh, down at Clearwater in the garage. What what goes on? I mean, are you made to sleep in a on the concrete in a garage filled with auto exhaust? Well, they give you a mattress, but yes, you have to live in the garage. But was it uh, what time of year? I mean, is it uh, March, April by this time? Well, it was Florida. Yeah, March and April. Yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't like cold. It just was. Uh, it was not. You know, we I lived in a room with sleeping with about 50 guys, I guess, maybe 60. And uh, there was no ventilation. It was a mess. So this is an enclosure inside the parking garage. Mm -hmm. Describe a typical day. Do they get you up at 6 a.m.? Uh, seems to me we got up at 5. But maybe that was on the sh No, it was, I think, 5 o'clock. We went to bed at 10, and uh, we had we worked for a couple of hours, and we had breakfast. And uh, it was basically just work all day. And then you have to audit one another, sec checking one another for uh, five hours a day. So you have a twin on the RPF mm -hmm. and this has to be miserable. Uh, do you pass out at night from sure exhaustion, mental, physical exhaustion? Or do you, or do you, or do you have nightmares? Do you stay awake? How do you sleep? How did you sleep on the RPF that third time? I didn't sleep. Uh, I was really upset 
um, uh, going to the RPF. And, uh, it took me about a month. I was on the RPF that time, seven months. It took me about a a month, I'd say, in that seven months before I could start sleeping. When David Mail called the Rock Slam, did you have the rank of lieutenant commander at that time? I'm trying to think. Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, Hubbard promoted me to lieutenant commander in, in 76, I think. 76, 77. So you're a Sea Org officer and you're busted and suddenly you're sleeping on a mattress. Yeah, and, and made, uh, to, made to wear these really short shorts. And it has to be in dark. At least on the ships, they gave you a, a boiler suit. But here at Flag, you're just running around. So you're basically slave labor during the day. Yep. And you're being sec checked at night, or you're sec checking your twin. Yeah, our days were basically doing things like chipping paint, uh, cleaning toilets. You know, we did all of the sanitary work. Yeah, all the all the uh, grunt work. You know, it's amazing. Uh, there's consistently stories throughout the decades of people in RPF chipping paint, and you wonder just how much paint Scientology has to chip. It's endless paint chipping. Well, it's uh, when you're on a ship. I almost lost my leg. Uh, uh, it, it turned gangrene from a. Uh, we were chipping paint on the side of the Apollo, and. Uh, uh, the device I was using was like like a, a steel wool sander type thing. To get down right. to steel, you have to continually, any ship, you have to continually uh, pinhole and, and paint. Or it starts, you know, the moisture starts eating into the uh, metal. Right. So I guess <laughs> yeah, that, that would explain why everybody's always chipping. Well, I can understand on the ship, sure. Uh, so what happened to your leg? Did the tool slip? And Well, I was on a uh, little raft. On the, I was uh, doing the water line of the Apollo. And uh, somebody jumped on the raft. And at that point, the device fell on my ankle. And uh, gouged a big hole. I, uh, my, it was just a mess. My leg was just a mess, and it, then it started getting gangrene. It, it was so painful. Uh, the pain was incredible. And uh, I think I, I mentioned this once that uh, my wife at the time, Jeannie, took me in session, and uh, in 30 minutes, all the pain was gone. It was just a severe pain. And within a couple of hours, the swelling started going down. I mean, my, my foot had... Uh, swollen, and my leg had swollen up almost to the size of a pumpkin, and uh, of course there were no antibiotics on board. So, uh, so your your wife handled it in session. Yeah, is this is also the 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 push push and pull. I mean, you have this incredible success, uh, and you you come out wondering, hey, you know, how can this be if he's he's uh, cheating on on this. Uh, on this control thing, you know, the overts and withholds. You know, one point uh, he also mentioned on this dispatch was this is the only way that I can control people. I think what I put on the ESM, EMSB board is probably more, is almost an exact quotation. I can't remember it as well right now, but uh, he pointed out this control. Control is his word not my word. This is how I control people. And uh, if this word gets out, I won't be able to control anybody anymore. Bill, you're going right to the central conundrum of the Church of Scientology that makes it uh, very hard for outsiders to understand. For Scientologists, and I'm not saying this applies to humanity universally by any means, a Scientologist, by definition, is someone for whom Scientology works. That is, they get some benefit out of it. Mm -hmm. Now, over against the benefit Scientologists obtain, there's a lot they put up with, overlook, endure, suffer. I thought so, I, I like your words, overlook and endure. Look, I was in the Christian church when I was a young man, 
studying for the ministry, I had to overlook and endure certain things that didn't work. And be, because I had a church experience, you know, I, I can relate. But it's more intense in Scientology. Scientology is a high-powered cult. Everything seems worse. It's more magnified. And, you know, in my experience of interviewing people who've been in the church, and, and most of my friends are former members. And so you get an innate feel for what people have to endure. So you get a big win in session, and yet you have to endure a lot of misery. And this gets to the nub of the matter. At what point do the losses and the suffering outweigh the wins? When do you throw in the towel and say, it's just too much? Yeah, I can get a win in session, but look at the hell I have to pay for this. A lot of, and, a lot of people don't, uh, and mainly because of this, this continual uh, atmosphere of confessionals. You're continually being introverted to find out what did you do that you're ashamed of and what did you with what didn't you tell anybody what did you try to hide and the whole idea is to come up with you know put you in a position of, of feeling ashamed and guilty and that's that's the whole crux of, of that that was the beginning of the end for me when I started to to realize all this so what so what you're saying is that for many Scientologists because of the the constant sec checking the confessions the auditing looking for overts and withholds having to write up everything they can't get to the point of saying the winds are outweighing the suffering they can't formulate that thought that's that's I, that's certainly what I experienced that's what you would call a cult term we use out here sometimes is the Truman Show the movie with Jim Carrey mm -hmm. where he his life is on television but he doesn't know it and then the whole thing breaks apart like a, a hammer on glass it all shatters so your cognitive structure collapses now that could be sudden it could be really sudden and fast or it could be a gradual erosion of your cognitive structure within Scientology. Was that was the third RPF for you defining, or was it still gradual? Did you still need a few more years to decide to leave? No. Uh, oddly enough, after uh, the RPF, my wife and I, she also did the RPF at the same time. We took a six-week leave I never had a leave before, and uh, we, two of those weeks, we went out to uh, stay with some friends in Minnesota, and uh, I didn't, I didn't remember this. I was reminded of it after uh, I had left, and Bob told me about this. He said, "Do you remember the time uh, we were sitting around drinking some beers, watching the Yankees on the?" Uh, on the television it was playoff season yeah and uh he said do you remember you said you were uh either you're gonna wait it out and get to the top and try to fix it and if you couldn't fix it you were gonna leave and uh i must have been drunk <laughs> but i did say <laughs> that apparently and uh so and that's that's really what my motivation was i didn't share that with very many people i was surprised i had then but uh to hear that i had that night but uh that was that's what kept me going and that's an interesting motivation because so you you still see there's enough worth in it for you to try to try to reform it at, or you're going to leave at, yeah at that point i still had hope and hope springs eternal <laughs> so you finish you no it does i mean that's what uh uh keeps many, many people going on a day-to-day -day basis, hope for a, a better life, hope for the future. Not to get ahead of things, but uh, often in a religious or spiritual experience, hope is sort of the precursor of what becomes a necessary disillusionment. <laughs> I see, okay. And it's sort of like if we had steps of despair, there's hope. <laughs> And then there's disillusionment. And I say that because I went through that in different parts of my life. So 
Well, I think the same uh, thing here. Is, <laughs> I think you've got that pegged. Well, it's human experience. And the only reason I know to use the language of necessary disillusionment is because I read about it from others who wrote about it since time immemorial. And, uh, but you know what, what's amazing, uh, Bill, is you go from RPF, right? You take a vacation, you uh, remember that you want to fix it or leave. And sure enough, uh, L. Ron Hubbard appoints you Executive Director International. What are the series of events leading up to you getting appointed to Executive Director International? Like what happens after your six week leave? Okay, I come back and uh, I got commented. I mean, Committee of Evidence, uh, you know, it's like going to a court martial. I mean, after your six week leave, your comment? Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> believe it. And uh, uh, so it was, it was welcome back from vacation, Bill. By the way, you're going to be court martialed. Yeah, we're going to RPF you again. <laughs> so I uh, somehow, I, I don't even remember, but, but that didn't happen. Uh, I got appointed to uh, the commanding officer of the International Training Org. It blossomed. I did a you know, really spectacular job there for Hubbard. And uh, he, I don't quite understand why at that point, but I started getting all these uh, uh, telexes from him. And, you know, welcome back and glad you're back and, and bangity bang. I knew I could count on you and uh, so I did this, did this thing, and and uh, I did really well at it, in his estimation, and I think that's what ended up. I didn't go right to uh, chairman of the board. I went. Uh, there was senior management exec, and that was the head guy. It was sort of the precursor to uh, being into ED International. So '79, I was senior management exec, and and then I became the uh, executive director. So executive director, executive director, Church of Scientology and chairman of the board. That's correct. Where was your office at? Well, I spent a lot of time at Watchdog Committee in Gilman Hot Springs. I was still married then to Jeannie. And so I lived at Clearwater and I had an office there. So I was sort of commuting back and forth. So what's it like, looking back on it, what was it like to be at the top of the Church of Scientology? Uh, did, you feel, did you feel a sense of power and affirmation? Did you feel acknowledged or did, was, were you, did you feel terror? Or What do you feel like when you're in that high of a level? I thought it was sort of a thankless job, but I was still determined to reform uh, the church. And uh, that, that just sort of, I really got into that. So, and now you were in a place where you had the power to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'd like to do is segue now in the, inter in, in the interview to this part where you have power to make things happen. And at that time, the Church of Scientology had missions, which were basically franchises. And they were an important part of the church for our uh, new Scientology watchers, people who don't know. What were the Scientology missions or franchises? What purpose did they serve and how important were they at that time in the church? Uh, yeah, they were called franchises originally and then uh, the attorneys decided to change the name from franchises or sent it too, like, too much like the McDonald's to uh, missions. You know, with the, the implication being that, you know, there were, you'd send somebody out into an area that you hadn't civilized yet. So it'd be like missionaries, churches, right. religion. Yeah, okay. So the Scientology missions were to bring in uh, new people to the church to evangelize? Exactly. And uh, they were what their position was, they were supposed to be feeding into, uh, there were supposed to be hundreds of these around every surrounding each organization. And they'd be feeding people in for the uh, higher levels at the organization. So the missions uh, offered low level services. And when you hit a certain level on the bridge, you would be passed to the next higher level organization? That's correct, yeah. 
Okay. How how big and successful and powerful were the missions? I mean, were they influential, ungodly, powerful, weak? Uh, they, you... they all some guys were doing really really well, and some people were very had made were making very good livings off of being mission holders because they were getting so many people in and uh, selling services. So some people. Uh, you could basically make a lot of money running missions. And weren't there people who had several missions? I mean, they, they owned six or 10 missions? Uh, yeah, I don't know if there were anybody who owned 10, but I know some people who owned four or five. And there were some big big names like Kingsley Wimbush, Alan Walter, uh, people like that. So they were, they were big players in the church. Mm -hmm. Now, is it true that L. Ron Hubbard grew wary or distrustful of the missions? Everything was fine when they were sending him a lot of money. <laughs> That's all it took to calm him down, you know. <laughs> that says everything. Well, money buys forgiveness, certainly, uh, in in corporate and and religion religious worlds alike. Now, Bill, you were telling me before the show that one of your goals to reform Scientology was to lower prices. Could you discuss that? Yeah, uh, this was, I think I mentioned this before, it was like a tautology. It was, it was obvious, you know, if you want more people, lower the prices so more people can afford it. Because even at that point, they had been raising the prices every year for six years. You may or may not remember the birthday game but every month the prices would go up. So hurry up and pay now. Well, was this part of Arne Hubbard's solution to inflation? Yes. Was to just raise prices every month? It's Well, it started out in 1974 as, as the birthday game, quote unquote. The birthday, of course, was his birthday. And, uh, and of course, it, 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 was, <laughs> it was sort of funny. It was the whole purpose of it was to make more money. Well, and that's what L. Ron Hubbard would want for his birthday money. That's right. So he, but he incorporated, usually he get people to do his own dirty work for him. But this time he came out with an LRH bulletin saying, this is, we're going to be, uh, this is the birthday game. And that was so successful. We made so much money and sent so much money to flag. He uh, then decided to do this every month. <laughs> this is funny just just as a side bill there's those kind of people that you know their birthday's coming up you know a family member someone you love right mm -hmm. and there's certain types there's two types of people people who love to get surprises oh surprise me whatever you give me i'll love and then there's other people who go i want money for my birthday or i want money for christmas i don't need a gift i want money so elrin Hubbard was like i don't want a watch or a present. I want money. Just give me money. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. want money for my birthday and lots of it. Lots of dead presidents. That's what I want. <laughs> Bill, would it be correct to say that uh, this raising uh, prices every month, the inducement here was I'd better pay for my bridge now because if I wait six months, it's going to be 30% higher. Was this the beginning of what are called advanced payments in the Church of Scientology? No. No. This was a reason to give advance payments. This is a new reason. But advance payments was a term that was used, uh, had been used for a long time. Oh, put, putting money on account. Mm -hmm. Well, this is an interesting point to just, to just uh, divert into for a moment. When the Church of Scientology takes money on account, it creates a, a liability for itself. Because it has money for yeah. future services it must deliver. Well, according to general accounting practices, yeah, but not <laughs> – the church has no liabilities, don't you know? <laughs> no, but I'm saying it, it never entered anyone – in the in level of the church, they want to take in as much money as possible, and whatever future liabilities may arise, they're not concerned with. Exactly, yes. So does the money get spent when it comes in? Yes. It's not a oh, it so it gets it, it gets basically it gets sent to flag. So you never actually accrue for future liabilities. No, never. You know, if you if you're selling eternity, then anybody who's going to deny his future eternity, you know, uh, is is 
crazy in an SP. Simple, easy. From that approach, you know, you're 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 uh, collecting money with the certitude that there's not going to ever be any refund. <laughs> you, because well, maybe, all, because only a criminal would ask for a refund. That's right. I don't remember, at least when I up till when I left, that there being any. Uh, there was no balance sheet. There, so there would be no record. The only thing, the only record that there would be of an advance payment would be an invoice in the person's PC folder or training folder. Well, the Church of Scientology lost its uh, religious tax exemption in 1967 when the IRS determined that monies inured to the benefit of L. Ron Hubbard and his family. Mm -hmm. The church's uh, records and accounting were a mess. And if you were saying that there was nothing on the balance sheet, there was no balance sheet. It's then that's even worse. And you're up there as executive director international, and you would know. You're up at the top of the church in '79, and there's no balance sheet. Okay, so you're you don't have a balance sheet to operate from. You don't you're not doing any financial planning other than bring in as much money as possible every week. Mm -hmm. And that's as sophisticated as it got. Never got any more sophisticated than I than that. Yes. That's no way to run a church or a business, but it gets overlooked because LRH finance policy, it, it, he didn't even use double entry accounting as I understand. No, there was very, very little uh, accounting at all. So the money just mysteriously went to flag and you never saw it again. Exactly. I mean, yes, that's, yeah, you just sent it without any, uh, I mean, we just send a lump sum. And you kept whatever the expenses were for the for uh, the church that week, or oh, yeah. But you also, you can not pay your staff. You know, you didn't have a lot of overhead. <laughs> I mean, this is, Bill, we're gonna have to do. What I'd like to do is another interview on the irrationality of money in the church, because we could go down. We, this would be a good 45 minute interview on finance policy. <laughs> no, I think it'd be a great one. I just, it, we're kind of going off topic. I want to get back to the mission holders. So why don't we bracket the part where we're talking about money and no balance sheet? Sure. Do that in another interview because I would love to have you explain or try, attempt to explain how this lunacy doesn't work. So we'll agree to do it in a part three. Okay. And I think people would eat it with a spoon. And we'll talk about refunds, repayments, and uh, things like that. We'll, we'll get well, then getting back on track. Bill, did you actually lower prices? Did you actually do that? Well, no. I mean, we that was the plan. That was my plan. And uh, we did acquire a lot of work uh, in Clearwater on this, putting everything together and sending it up. And uh, the reaction was, it was like stepping on the third rail, you know, in a the uh, subway. It, it was electric. <laughs> it was just like, bam! Uh, what the fuck are you guys doing down there? You, you, they were enraged that you actually went to lower prices. Yes. Even though the public had been surveyed and they wanted lower prices. Well, yeah, the the prices were. I mean, now I, I guess they're. At, there were really astronomical, but uh, they were quite high back then too. And uh, I think was, they were they, they were super expensive. Well, I thought so. Yes. Yeah, back then they were super expensive. My first meeting uh, with a church register, uh, he told me I needed to pay twelve thousand dollars for life repair. <laughs> and this was in the early '80s, like twelve thousand dollars. I told him. I said, the guy's name was Rafi, a reg at, at LA Day. Mm -hmm. he, he really, I did the personality test, the OCA, and he, I'll tell this story sometime, but basically he said, time was not my friend when I'm in, in the reactive mind, and he made it sound dire and ominous, and that <laughs> bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's, there's always that apocalyptic uh, approach. <laughs> Well, bottom line, Rafi, Rafi said that it was I needed to spend twelve thousand dollars for life repair, and I mean that's not even on the bridge. That's just like to even get to the bridge, I need to put out twelve thousand dollars. 
and I had student debt. You know, I had just got my degree. And uh, I said to him bluntly, I said, Rafi, I'm not $12,000 fucked up. I'm sorry. I'm not. <laughs> and he didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was not $12,000 fucked up. And most people are not $360,000 fucked up. You can handle things for a lot less money. What does 360000 get you these days? Well, $360,000 is the number on the internet. It, and it's been calculated. We, uh, uh, Tony Ortega calculated it. $360,000 is the approximate number it takes if you were new off the street to go from being brand new in the church to OT7. And that's kind of an accepted ballpark number. In reality, it's probably as much money as they can get from you. And the church likes to say that you can co-audit, you can go up the bridge and train as an auditor and it's a lot cheaper. And yet there's people who've spent $500,000 and they're not even clear. <laughs> So 360,000 is just sort of a, a term of art to describe the Scientology ride. Uh, I imagine some people have gone to OT7 for less money, but I imagine there's more people who've spent upwards of a million dollars to go to OT8. It would seem uh, that way. Well, now with the IES membership, you know, they want you to kick in. To be invited onto the OT levels these days, you have to have uh, contribute money to your... IS status, which is an, another interesting thing. Uh, the Safe Environment Fund that they created to fund uh, the defense of the Snow White uh, criminals. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, what I've been, <laughs> and I'm going to do a show on this with somebody, but basically, the Safe Environment Fund, uh, one of the brilliant Scientology lawyers, the WOG lawyers, said, told David Miscavige, and I guess this got to the uh, Commodore himself, that the best thing to come out of the Safe Environment Fund was that nobody asked for refunds. It was free money, and it was for legal defense, so it was sort of open-ended because you could legally defend anything. The Safe Environment Fund, and I did an essay on this for Tony Ortega, became the basis of the IES, the International Association of Scientologists. The idea is give us money to defend the Scientology religion and expand the religion. And under U.S. Uh, tax law, that's money that's not dedicated, so you can spend it on anything. Yeah. It's, and, and you know what? If you think about it, Bill, auditing is hard to deliver. You've got a lot of uh, – there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. There's a lot of people involved in case supervising, folders, programming. DFP, all that kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So really, if if I'm the leader of a cult, it would be much easier if you would just simply give me money and I didn't have to do anything. I could give you a glorified bowling trophy and you could have your picture taken with me. I don't have to do anything and I get money. And a medal. You get a medal these days. Don't and you? I get, I get, I get, you get a medal and you get status. <laughs> now, going back to 79 when you were the man uh, in the big chair... You actually had to deliver hours of well done auditing, well done auditing hours, mm -hmm. yes, to get your to, to earn your daily bread, correct? That's that's correct, yeah. So now what you said is you put in a proposal to uh, those on high to lower prices, and they were electrified. Did they want to string you up? I I I don't know. I just know that it, it was just it was as if. Uh, we had burned the Koran or something, you know? Well, money uh, money is God in Scientology, so it's as if you'd committed blasphemy. Yeah, exactly. So since you were now a blasphemer, what did they do with you? What happened? Well, it's it was the, the reaction was so startling that I, I realized, hey, I really want to find out if, if I have the control of the levers <laughs> to change this or if I don't. And that's when I came upon the idea of using the mission holders who were really my allies. Uh, 
I mean, they were into expanding Scientology. Hubbard was into money. And uh, so that's when I came up with the idea of having the mission holder meetings. Now, you've hit upon a, a point, uh, one of the great divides in the Church of Scientology. You said the mission holders wanted to expand Scientology, meaning they wanted to put out the technology into society, have people being audited, the real vision of growing Scientology as a subject in the world, correct? That's, that's exactly what I mean, yes. And, and Hubbard was a reductionist. He just wanted more money. Now, this contradicts the church's stated claim that it's about ex ex expansion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're right in the snake pit between idealists who want to expand Scientology's subject and the founder who just wants the cash. So you're, you're in the gun sites. Because the missions are so powerful back then, they're your allies. So what, you, you convene them at a meeting. What happens? Well, I had uh, the first meeting was supposed to be, was called for in November. And uh, what happened was they, uh, I was called to WDC back to Gilman Hot Springs on a, <clears throat> some, other, some other project. And uh, basically, I was kidnapped. You were kidnapped? Yes. And I was told I cannot return. And uh, I won't go into all that, but it was... It was... Well, well, no. Well, no. I mean, I, I heard uh, a story that you were actually tied to a chair for something like 12 hours. Yeah, probably. I mean, they actually physically tied you to a chair? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of hard. It's demeaning to even look back at it. Yes. There is post-traumatic stress disorder, and I'm not saying this in any way to, to trifle with your feelings. I just, it, it's, it's shocking to anyone's sensibilities that you would be kidnapped, held against your will, and tied in a chair. It's demeaning. Yeah, it was also demeaning that uh, my wife at the time, it, it wasn't, I guess this is a, a message, you know, like how they, they send a dead fish in The Godfather? Yeah, they uh, a guy named Jens Bogvat, nice guy. Uh, it was a, do a medical doctor, and uh, she eventually married him. He took over the mission holder meetings, and he was supposed to follow the uh, what Miskevich wanted him to say. Meanwhile, I finally it, it dawned on me shortly after uh, the first couple of the first week, I guess. Uh, I started saying, "Look, I'm going to the police if you if you hold me here." And uh, I said, "You ever read the Declaration of Independence?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, they sent me back, and uh, but it was, the mission holder meeting had already happened. That's why they sent me back. Well, they were like keeping you on ice until the mission holder meeting was over. Yes, that's correct. And so. I, I reconvened it for, uh, I think it was the first or second week in December. Bill, let me jump in to say, look, they commit a felony kidnapping so that Miscavige can override you. And this is something that recurs over and over. The church thinks it's a law unto itself. So if they have to kidnap and unlawfully imprison Bill Franks so that they can do something to oppose you, they'll do that, and it's inconsequential to them. You actually have to threaten to go to the police to get released? Yes. In what universe is this normal? It's normal in Scientology, you know. <laughs> it is. I, I just, I, it, it, but, but it's an outrage to those outside the church that this goes on. So you, re, you reconvene the mission holders. What happened? Well, we had... It went on for three days. It was uh, video. We had a video uh, camera for all of the meetings. This was December 1981? Yeah. This is like the second week, I think, in December of 81. Now, were you trying to convene the mission holders to build consensus, to reform the church, decrease prices, make things better? Yes. I was also trying to get leverage against whatever was going on over, over there uh, with Miscavige. See, I didn't quite understand his, I, I didn't know what he was doing with Hubbard at the time and that he was basically 
cutting out everybody, like D.D. Resorf, for example. All the people who had, uh, who Hubbard liked, who had put on post, he got rid of them all. And his job was basically to uh, just isolate Hubbard and play off this paranoia. Now, that's my, my premise, but I don't know that for sure. After the first day, literally, Jeff, everybody in Watchdog Committee, everybody except for Hubbard himself, called me in Florida to say, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And I just had this refrain saying, well, if you guys think you're running something, you're going to have to be accountable for it. Watchdog Committee, nobody knows who they are, and uh, there's no policy considering this. And besides, I'm the executive director. I think the second day I had Mark Yeager come down, and he was the CEO of the CMO, I guess, at that time, Commoner's Messenger Org. And uh, he, he literally, this is no exaggeration, he, he was trembling. Because, see, most of these guys were just really kids, and they didn't know, they, they didn't know anything. I mean, they were just kids, not even like Dave Miscavige, uh, eighth, ninth grade education. Had no idea what it was like in the real world. Or, and here I am, I'm saying to them, you're going to have to meet all these people. And they're going to have to meet you and, and learn who you are. Jaeger begged me on his hands and knees uh, one day, often it was in a motel room, and said to me, he said, look, I don't want to call Muscovich. I said, get him on the phone. I'll talk to him. If these guys want to deal with this. They're going to have to come to Florida. And sure enough, I think the uh, second night, of the three-day event, I I, uh, I had my Harley still, and I went <laughs> went out to meet them at the airport. They all came to Clearwater. There were, as I said, there were ten or eleven of them. They started putting full court press on me to cancel the meetings, and I said, "No, you guys are going to have to meet." I mean, Norm Starkey was there, Miscavige, and. Uh, Every there were, as I said, there was quite a few people, and uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't cave to that. So the final day, Miscavige, uh, I had been up the entire night before. We we got into a couple of fist fights. Uh, really, actual fist fights. Yes. Luckily, uh, Alan Walters was uh, he he came to the meeting with me all night. And uh, he was an old, uh, I think, a, a rugby star. Yeah, and, uh, big guy. He was a good, good friend to have that night. <laughs> uh, and, but I said, no, you guys are going to have to be at the meeting. And so that's what happened that following day. It was, it was a real sort of come to Jesus type meeting. They tried to grab control of the mission holders, but the mission holders weren't going to have it. And I. I suspect that that is why they treated him so roughly that following October uh, in San Francisco. You mean at the so-called Mission Holders Massacre? Yeah, where they uh, totally uh, stripped them of all their wealth. And they threat yeah, and they threatened them with prison for violating trademarks, copyrights, etc. Mm -hmm. So this this meeting in December '81 was the precursor to that. But I want to ask you this question because it's been debated for a long time online among former members, executives. Do you think L. Ron Hubbard himself ordered the Mission Holder Network to be destroyed? This is what I think. I think that uh, Miskevich uh, parlayed this thing into Hubbard telling Hubbard, and convincing Hubbard that they're going to take over Scientology. That's what this whole thing is. It's a revolt. And uh, they're all apostates. <laughs> I think he probably, my guess is he got Hubbard to sign off on it on that basis. Now, you had mentioned before the show that this, to use the language of Scientology, this keyed in Hubbard on an earlier loss where he lost Dianetics to Don Purcell. Uh, back in Wichita. Mm -hmm. 
I believe that that probably was the, as he would say, the earlier similar, you know, the the earlier incident that that reminded him of the near jeopardy he was in, losing his whole uh, source of money. Yeah, and for for new Scientology watchers, just by way of history, L. Ron Hubbard's first Dianetics Foundation uh, went bankrupt. He started it again in Wichita with the help of a millionaire named Don Purcell. Mr. Hubbard, as was his want, basically took a lot of money out of the business and it became bankrupt and Don Purcell was left on the hook for the bills. So Purcell bought the assets of the Dianetics Foundation out of bankruptcy. And those assets included the actual copyright in the book Dianetics. So Don Purcell owned Dianetics and the name and the copyrights and Elron Hubbard was up the creek. Hubbard didn't like this and he started, and this is my argument that Fair Game started with L. Ron Hubbard's real vicious campaign against Don Purcell. Hubbard stole the mailing list from the Dianetics Foundation, immediately began contacting the membership base, slandering Don Purcell, calling him a, co a communist, a criminal, every name in the book, until finally Purcell just relents and says, you know what? I came in to support Hubbard because I like Dianetics, but screw it, Ron, here's your book back. I'm done with you. Mm -hmm. And later on at the 93 War is Over speech, Miscavige talks about that as a power push. In your opinion, does Miscavige push the mission holders to Hubbard as this is another power push to take over what's yours, sir? There's no doubt. And you know, uh, while you're you were talking, it just reminded me of what's the first thing that Miscavige did is he, he formed RTC. Yes. And he got all the copyrights. That's what he did. You know, I, there are a lot of different things that he could have done, but that was the first thing he did, which may make sense from his point of view, but I don't think from a production point of view, it uh, makes a lot of sense. It is a, well, the natural conclusion is grab the copyright. Well, no, that's where the money is and that's where the control is. Because if you think of Scientology in terms of franchising, mm -hmm. if you own the copyrights, then you can control all the franchises at your will. Exactly. Yeah. You wind up being voted out of power December 27, 1981. Mm -hmm. who, who votes you out of power? The board of the church? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I don't, I can't say each board member, uh, but there was a whole, it was, I think there was at least 10 guys came down from, uh, ask Mike Rinder, he, he attended the meeting as well. He was the CEO of the CMO at Clearwater then. Well, had you had tendered prior to this date an undated resignation? No, no, I was so, just, no, I was fired. So you got, you got fired for whatever, insubordination, uh, blasphemy, treachery, Whatever, did they give you an actual cause? Trying to cause a revolt in the church, which is not what I was, what my intent was, but that's how they perceived it. Well, now that's an interesting juxtaposition. You want to reform and what you see as meaningful reform, meaningful and substantial reform, they see as a revolt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and interesting, so you, isn't it? Well, it is, and it depends, you know, in, in power struggles, it often depends, you know, what side you're on. Uh, the loser is always the bad guy. So you're you're out of a job. After you lose your position as executive director, chairman of the board, Hubbard wants you to go see his personal physician, Dr. Gene Denk. Yes. How soon after you were fired did that happen? Just, uh, it was maybe a week. No. To tell our listeners about this because th this is a really quite a mind-blowing story. Yeah, I, I went to uh, Los Angeles because that's I had lived there for some years and I had some what I considered friends. But it turned out all my friends were now working for David Miscavige. And I was being watched 24 hours a day. And uh, I was staying at this home of this fellow I I just can't remember the name, but it was him and his wife. And one day, I had been there just a few days, I got a letter from Hubbard that was delivered to me. Now, I'm thinking, well, how does he know where the hell I am? Well, I subsequently found out, but uh, 
said, Dear Bill, uh, I'm really concerned about you and uh, I want you to go see my doctor. I'll I'll take care of all the, the medical charges. L. Ron Hubbard, you know. So I went to see Jane Dink. Jane Dink was, was had been his physician for quite a while. I, I, maybe I'm not ex being exact there. I don't know how many years, but it had been a while. It wasn't like this was this doctor was very familiar with the Hubbard family and L. Ron particularly. So I went there the first time. I said, well, what am I what am I here for? I was had hoping I was going to get into back into a dialogue with Hubbard. And uh, he said to me, he didn't know anything about me being removed or any of that. He knew that uh, I was there because Hubbard had thought I had been PDH. That means pain drug and hypnosis by one of the uh, American intelligence agencies. Most specifically the uh, FBI, but it could have been the CIA, whatever. <laughs> so he took every bodily fluid I had, and uh, that, of course, turned out to be negative. So after uh, after the second or during the second visit, Gene Dank started talking to me and telling me that I asked him about how uh, Hubbard was doing physically. I didn't know if he was doing bad or, or good or whatever, and I just wanted to know. And uh, I mean, obviously, I still had some loyalties towards him, towards Hubbard. And he said, well, you know, he's not doing very well. He's uh, got dementia and uh, he's getting extremely paranoid. And I didn't understand why he was talking to me. I mean, first of all, it's sort of a confidential thing about a patient. Secondly, uh, why he was talking to me, I don't know. But then in retrospect, at that time I didn't know, but in retrospect, I think he was sort of looking, seeing if I could help. He said a lot of people are playing, uh, getting, I'm trying to think what his exact words were. Uh, he basically was asking me for help, if I could help. And I told him that I, I, I eventually told him that, no, I'm not on the job anymore. But he said, well, my diagnosis is, is that he has a dementia and that he's he's getting more and more paranoid every day. Uh, this is uh, very telling because Dank's reaching out to you for help. He sees you as, as uh, one of the key leaders of the church. And here you have the, the founder slipping the dementia. He had to turn to somebody, you know, to see what can we do to help. Did Dr. Dank feel that uh, L. Ron Hubbard was being, uh, was, there was elder abuse, that people were taking advantage of his deteriorating state? That's what he was implying, but he didn't get into a lot of specifics. It was more, I think it was more of like he was asking me how I could help without, without, putting his patient in an embarrassing position. Oh, I see. So what, What? Uh, you know, how can maybe, how can we ramp Mr. Hubbard down out of leadership and how can you take over and sort of keep the secret? Mm -hmm. Now, this is a, a absolutely fascinating to me because you have Hubbard deteriorating and you have a new guard emerging, the, the, the David Miscavige camp aided and abetted by people like Norman Starkey. Yeah. And there's, and you've just been tossed out of power in, in what is a power push, a purge, if you will. Were you aware of, uh, of that at the time that you, that there was a, a new guard coming in to take over the church? Yeah. I, well, I knew, I knew it was uh, Miscavige who was, I didn't know how much Hubbard was involved. And that's why when I first got that letter from, from, from him, and then he subsequently uh, had me audited for three weeks, uh, and he did all the CSing of it, the case supervising. Person, he personally supervised, case supervised it? Yeah, I believe he, uh, you know, she'd send the folders up to him every couple of days. 
And of course, we were in L.A., so it wasn't that hard getting it up to wherever he was. What did what did Aaron Harper want you audited on? It was sec checks again. <laughs> yeah, he was trying to come up and find out, you know, what crimes I had had. So really, in one way, it does show Hubbard still has a, a certain amount of uh, feeling for you. Yeah, I think he was reaching out to me. But of course, at the time, I didn't feel that way. I felt uh, kind of oppressed. <laughs> well, certainly, you, you certainly you, you, you would. Uh, and it may also be that uh, Mr. Hubbard wanted to know the extent you know, he wanted to do some damage control here. Hubbard would sometimes destroy people with just, you know, by the snap of his fingers. Other times, maybe he, he attempted to salvage them. But in the end, it seems nobody does well who's in proximity to L. Ron Hubbard. Yep. Did you begin to feel like you were collateral damage in Scientology? Not at the time. No, I felt just like I had lost. You know, I felt, I felt really pretty down. I felt like I had sort of uh, uh, let down everybody who wanted to be in Scientology. I can understand that. Your position of leadership and you'd let them down. You'd. Uh, it's hard to come to terms with failure, especially when you have a high and noble, what you feel is a high and noble purpose. You can't really talk to anybody about it. I mean, who could you talk to? My auditor. <laughs> And well, that's talking to L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I was pretty well isolated, particularly as I found out that every every person, literally every person who I uh, was a, a minder, you know, had was in on the scheme with Miscavige, and was reporting to him. So Miscavige was having you surveilled and followed. Yeah, you were followed for about fifteen years after you left the Church of Scientology. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, I, I didn't understand why. I mean, in 1985, I was working in uh, New York City, and the building I was working in was Rockefeller Center. Uh huh. One day, I, I ran into this PI who had been following me around up in, on the 42nd floor where I worked, and I invited him into the office for a cup of coffee. <laughs> And he was just laughing. He said, you know, it's like they really think they got something on you. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you work in Rockefeller Center, right? He's a big enemy of the church, right? And I said, you know, I really don't know about that, but we all had a good laugh about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, L. Ron Hubbard associated uh, Rockefellers with the, the psychs, yep. the, you know, psychiatry. And uh, there you are. In, there you are in Psych Central, New York City. Well, Bill, it's been very fascinating. I appreciate you sharing uh, your recollections and memories. These are very interesting stories, because this is a recurring pattern of Miscavige cannot let go. He followed Pat Broker for 25 years. Yeah, I know. It's I, I read that somewhere. It's it's just amazing. Jesus, can you imagine how much money that they spent? Well, they were being well paid to do this full time. If you talk about Aaron Hubbard being paranoid, well, his his successor certainly is uh, even perhaps more so than the Commodore himself. It remains to be seen, you know, what the final days of David Miscavige will look like. He could go another 50 years, another three weeks. Who knows? Who knows? Because when you have $3 billion paranoia and uh, your own private intelligence organization called the Office of Special Affairs, you can, you can be very resourceful. But in the current context of movies like Going Clear, Louis Thoreau's My Scientology movie, the internet, things like what we're doing just talking because we have a simple internet connection, mm -hmm. It's asymmetrical, and the church doesn't know how to respond to a lot of it. So we're living in very interesting times. If you're a former member of the Church of Scientology, a Scientology watcher, or interested in the subject, what I'm trying to do on Surviving Scientology Radio is just to get the facts out and let people like you tell their stories because they're so very important to be told, and I appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, I think, it, well, I think it's important for people who are trying to get all this make-believe out of their heads and get on with their lives 
and also people who are thinking about joining. <laughs> uh, in, in both respects, you know, it's things started getting clearer for me when I started looking at what the real intent of Hubbard was. And when I realized it was just to make money, and when I finally accepted that fact, which was a matter of years, it wasn't wasn't real quick. Uh, it, the hold he had over me started dissipating very quickly. That's a very uh, captivating insight. And we'll discuss it uh, when we meet next.